Thank you so much. Uh, it is really exciting to get to be uh, in the digital playground with everybody today. And uh, yeah, I really, um, there's, a, there's a million things I want to cover about a couple of related ideas. And, and, and one of the key things is just um, starting from a few things that we probably all share in common. One thing I would say is uh, on average, most of us will, by the end of our lives, have spent about five years of our lives with our thumbs on the glass of our phones or similar devices. And we're probably not average. I bet you all spent a little more than that time. And so that's something I sit with a lot. And that also leads me to think, and I'll get a little bit into the background of where I come from in terms of like the work I've done and the communities I've been part of, but it leads me to think a lot about the fact that we are going to do that, spend that time with that phone using apps, tools, and services that were built by uh, really a small handful of folks. Um, that's who leads those efforts. And how many of the people that build those apps that we use every day, those sites that we go to every day, uh, are folks that we would willingly hang out with at a party? How many of them would we go if they invited us to their party, right? Because we just heard like Prince singing party at the end of 1999. And I'm like, I would go to his party. I do not know that I would go to Mark Zuckerberg's party. And the reason I start from that is because if this is a place we are spending years of our lives, and it is the place that we mediate our connection, our conversation, our community, our communion with others, then it should be worthy of what we do when we choose the parties that we go to and the people that we hang out with and places that we spend time and the places that we find meaning. So I just wanted to set that as the context of the, the sort of broader conversation that we'll ha have today. And I'll give a little bit of background on me. I have been for most of my career, the tech guy in a room full of people that weren't the tech people. Um, so whether that was, I mean, early in my career, I worked in the construction industry, but like in media, in publishing, in uh, uh, the music business and, and all these different industries. And then, you know, especially um, in, in the sort of the last half of my career at that intersection of, you know, social platforms, social technologies, and how do we give people power? How do we give people the power to create? How do we give people the power to organize? How do we give people the power to um, make an internet of their own, uh, which is a little bit of an old fashioned idea that I think maybe is coming back. And um, and I've been really, really lucky. I've gotten to um, kind of get a front row seat to uh, people building a lot of the tools and the platforms, you know, for better and for worse. And so a lot of what, um, you know, I try to do, I'm really lucky to get to do in a platform like this is uh, share a little bit about, about what we learned and maybe what we can look at going forward. Because um, let's look at the sort of the world around us in the built environment, right? I live in New York City, uh, very proudly a resident of Lower East Side, very involved in my community. Uh, I bet a lot of you all are the same kind of folks, right? So um, if I had to guess, you probably have feelings about the bike lanes uh, and, and the green spaces in your towns. You have feeling about, um, you know, the, what your community does to educate young people. Like, I think there's there's probably a lot of these things that we think about uh, and everything from the built environment to the social environment that we participate in, that we contribute to, that we're part of. Um, and those are disciplines that when we do it in the physical world are incredibly mature. If we think about urban planning and urban design, if we think about all manner of sort of civic participation. Um, and then even thinking about related fields like uh, anthropology and how these communities work together or, uh, you know, just architecture. How do you build a space that people want to hang out in or that they're going to use in a creative way or that they're going to make their own? And I start with those disciplines because um, even as a, uh, a person who may not be formally educated in all these topics, you probably have some fluency in them to a certain degree. Right. You certainly know, you know, if I talk about a skyscraper, you know what that is. If I talk about a bungalow, you have an idea of what that looks like. And similarly, if we talk about, um, you know, a, a self organizing group, uh, we kind of know what that means at, at a social level, um, even if we haven't studied theory. And that's really, really important because those are our analogs about how, what we teach each other, what people grow up in, in a context, in a community. And how we form our expectations. And they are, as I think we all know, incredibly flawed. They have systemic biases. They have all the institutional shortcomings that we, I think a lot of us spend our, our, our days and our nights um, fighting to try to correct. But we know them. We know them. Even if they're broken, even when they're broken, 
um, we know what it looks like with the space around us. So we know how to interact with them. And, and, and um, you know, when we see somebody struggled across the street because it doesn't have an affordance for their ability or their disability, we know what the street could look like, but we know it's a street. And I start with that because um, this is missing from our understanding of this digital experience that we all spend our time in. Uh, the level of fluency we have in thinking about the architecture, the anthropology, uh, the social design, the urban design, the civic design of digital platforms um, is something where we don't have a history. And what I would actually argue is not that um, there isn't a history, but there's been an intentional strategy to divorce us from the history that comes before us. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I'll sort of get into that. But I think I just want to start with that assertion. And by the way, any point here, feel free to jump it in the chat if you got questions or you want a clarification or uh, if I can restate something to make it clear, don't be shy about that. But I want to start with this assertion that um, there's an ahistorical or almost anti-historical way of talking about technology in the world. And very often, and particularly particular in communications and connection and community technologies, uh, there is an attempt to sort of pretend we're at the beginning of history all the time and that nothing has come before us and, and there's nothing to learn. And so what I want to do before we start going into this is I am kind of unabashedly going to go into uh, middle age dad mode here and show you some good old days shit. I'm going to go to um, some of the stuff that formed and shaped a lot of um, popular culture's perception of what, you know, especially large scale social platforms could be. Um, this one I'm going to go, and I apologize because I can't see everybody when I'm sharing screen, so I'll, I'll rely on you to jump in the chat and, and respond. But uh, I bet some of you will be just old enough to remember this one. This is MySpace and what it looked like in its heyday. I couldn't find a capture of the old version of this site that actually had Tom's face on it. Um, and Tom was the guy that was uh, automatically friended to you when you joined MySpace uh, but, uh, but there's some, some nostalgic vibe for some folks on that. Um, I look at black planet, which incredibly pioneering social platform, um, which was a lot of people's introduction to identity based community, right. Sort of mapping to who we are in the physical world into our online world and, uh, really helped shape what people have thought of, of what you could do online and how you could connect. Um, one that's really close to my heart, uh, livejournal.com. I ended up working with these folks for several years and, and, and still good friends with a lot of people that made this work. Um, it was uh, really seminal in things like fan culture and um, you know what evolved into stan culture online, uh, but also technically it was really incredible because it's probably the first social network to reach 10 million users uh, at a time when that was considered like huge and impressive and hard to do. Um, and then one more, um, sort of the end of that beginning era uh, was Flickr, which is probably the last of the like first wave of social networks that predated the, you know, the Facebooks of the world um, and really invented a lot of the stuff, even just basic stuff like taking a picture on your phone and sharing it with your friends in real time. Um, we're sort of all built there. And I start with this stuff, one, because um, it's fun. It is it, like it has a heartwarming feeling for people that are old enough to remember those, or if you have a you know older sibling or something, probably your parents were on them. Um, Asian Avenue, I see that in the chat. That was a sibling site to Black Planet from a lot of the same founders. Um, yeah, you know, and there's many more I can mention. Zanga was one that was around, um, and um, you know, people's memories of them are deeply personal, deeply evocative. Uh, people have nostalgia for them like they do over a favorite movie or an old record or album that they love, right? It's a different thing than people feel about the app today. And and notice I showed you all that um, MySpace first. And who do you think of when you think of MySpace? You think of Tom. It's a person. It's a dude. And he really did write code that helped make that site, right? Like he was part of it. He did it. And, you know, if you look at on your phone today, like y'all got Instagram on there. I know you feel guilty about it, but it's on there. Except Jackie, I see you probably don't. And, um, you know, you you look at that, you think, okay, I think Instagram's owned by LiveJournal. I'm sorry, I'm throwing myself back by Facebook. And uh, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. But Mark Zuckerberg didn't write any of the code in the Instagram app on your phone, right? Like he's not the guy. He's the guy who the guy works for, the person that made that app works for. And that's a different thing. 
that's a different thing than being the person that made something. And all these sites had in common was also uh, almost a sense of place, right? You had a vibe, you had an energy, you had a design, you had a look. Uh, some of them weren't that intentional. They might not have been, you know, the highest pinnacle of art. But think about one of the things that you, if you spend time on um, Live Journal or on on MySpace, people's pages all look like them. They might have been messy. They might have had a lot of noise going on visually or audio, but um, probably no two pages look the same, right? And it wasn't just the same background and the same borders and the same look on everybody's page. And I see Geo Cities in the chat. Yes. Um, and so I want to call that out because that wasn't that long ago. It was not that long ago that millions of people had places online that they had some agency and some control over that was theirs. And if you think about that starting point, uh, I was talking about of a party, going to a party, whose party do you want to go to? If you're going to have company over, what's the first thing you think about? Right? It's like, is my place ready for folks to come over? Am I going to clean up a little bit, tidy up a little bit? I'm going to have some music playing. I'm going to be some snacks out. You know, like, like it's just what you do when you think about building a place that people are going to spend time. Uh, I don't think you think, how could I make something that would appeal to every single person on earth? That's not how you throw a party. That's not how you build a community. That's not how you build a sense of place. And it's really important because even in our physical built world, we have learned what makes a space welcoming. Right. So we know about, um, you know, the width of the hallways in a building is going to decide whether people convene there or just pass through. Uh, you know, we look at the affordances of how much of our um, outdoor architecture, our public, ostensibly public architecture, um, is so hostile to basic things like sitting down. Right. And and these these hostile architectures evolved because the spaces originally weren't. Right. They didn't have spike strips on everything or stop skateboarders from being able to go everywhere. When it was first built, they had to retrofit it to become hostile. By default, our spaces were welcoming in some ways. And so that's a really important thing to do is like to think about by default, we make them welcoming. By default, we make them suitable to a purpose. And by default, we make them for an imagined group of people uh, and for a certain purpose. And that's just something that... um, it's really, really important to think about because we now have, you know, probably a full generation or two of people that use digital experiences, the apps and the sites that they go to every day, um, for whom it is almost like the built environment, like to go onto Instagram or, you know, whatever sort of TikTok, whatever service you're using is almost like this inevitability that is handed to you from mostly a bunch of strangers. Maybe, you know, somebody who worked there once upon a time, but for the most part, you don't know who they are. Um, and we do have a pretty good view into the values of the people that cre- that own the spaces, but we don't have anything like credits for who makes them. And that's really, really important because uh, creating digital experiences and, and, and apps is a, a blend of the creative expression and this sort of, you know, business function, dry scientific side of things. And, and the way I sort of think about this is, we know when somebody says they make music, that that's an expressive medium. We know when somebody says they write, that that's an expressive medium. We can think that about all forms of art and creativity. Even though there are people that make music as a profession or for you know corporate use, there are people that write at work. We all do that. Um, but we know that these can be expressive media. But when somebody says they're a coder or they're a you know, project manager, product manager, those kinds of titles, people know those folks. Um, it doesn't occur to us that that could be an expressive medium so much. It doesn't occur to us that there could be people that are uh, party planners. And so I call that out because there is still a broad cultural understanding that the internet could be something that people make, right? Not just that companies make, but that people make. There is nobody that thinks that, um, for example, uh, writing is something that is only done by giant trillion dollar corporations. Right. They are keenly aware that the things that move us, the things that we remember, um, you know, the note that I have in my wallet that I've had in the last 20 years, that is a note that my wife wrote for me after like one of our first dates, like that's writing, 
<laughs> and that's from a person and it means the world to me. And so I think that's something that I um, want to remind people because how often do you hear it? When is the last time you open an app on your phone or you went to a website on your laptop and you know who made it and you know how they feel about you and they were from a community that you're from and you had some kinship or some connection to them? Think about it. And if you're like me, I think a lot of us spend time, you know, if I watch a good movie, I might look at the credits after and sort of say, like, who did this? Who made this? Let me find out about this. I might be curious. Um, you know, I certainly I read the the dedication and the books that I love. Like, who did they write this for? Who was the person that inspired them to create this? Um, you know, whatever, you know, whatever you're into. If you love music, you're like, where's that sample from? And you know, what's what's the the kind of the history and and the context of this? And, you know, music is closest to my heart. I think of how many artists I love talk about, well, I came up in the church. This is how we played music in our neighborhood. This is the community that we're from. I'm part of a scene that created these things together. And I have never in my life had somebody tell me, well, this is the kind of app that we made in church growing up. And it just doesn't happen. They don't say it. And they could. They could. There is no reason that that can't be a common experience, an everyday experience. Um, and it matters a lot because these owned digital spaces that are controlled by, like I said, about a half a dozen of you know, these trillion dollar companies have become our public spaces, right? So when you gather in public, you have the ability to do things. You can march, you can organize, you can take up space, you can be yourself, you can be vulnerable, you can do all the things we do in the world together. Is how we build community and find the people that we want to party with. And, but in a corporate space, there's a limit on things you can do, right? Uh, I come back to an example that I, that sticks with me a lot. I'm dating myself a little bit because, um, well, not everybody probably was, was in the moment then, but uh, you know, when Occupy happened, um, it, it was, a, it was something profound being in New York at that time. And, and it felt like, um, you know, I had a lot of criticisms, but like it was significant. You couldn't ignore, you know, the the, the weight of the moment, the visibility of the moment. But um, those of you who were paying attention to media and news at that time will remember that the location that it was said to have been organized was called Zuccotti Park. But um, what Zuccotti Park is is actually a privately owned public space. Um, when when New York's uh, um, uh, city government was struggling with finances in the 60s and 70s. They made a trade-off that said that uh, corporations that wanted to build super high towers could get additional air rights to build if they agreed to give over some nominal space around the edges of their lots to what was called a privately owned public space. And the idea was you could uh, uh, make it look like a park and maybe people would use it like a park and that would be a public good. And in exchange for providing that public good, you get to have a taller building, make some more money. Uh, it succeeded in getting taller buildings. By the measure of the city's own record, 85% uh, of these failed as public spaces. They don't work. Because as it turns out, nobody wants to hang out in the lobby of the Sony building on Fifth Avenue. They won't let you eat a sandwich there. Uh, they won't let unhoused people rest there. They won't let you throw a ball with your kid there. It, it fails every test of what a public space could be. But it did comply with policy and it uh, accomplished the goal that they had set out for, for what those were going to be. And the wild thing about it is a privately owned public space in the digital world would be an improvement over what we've been given thus far. If we got upgraded to merely having a lobby that we could hang out in, if it was raining, that would be better uh, than what a lot of these large uh, tech platforms are providing us. And um, I see the question about the implementation of these privately owned pub public digital spaces. Well, um, what happened was was um, was essentially captured uh, by default. Uh, the architecture of the internet, the the initial innovations of it, were created by public entities. Now, a lot of these were involved in um, uh, in the military uh, in early days. So I don't want to sort of paper over that, but it was public money and a lot of it was academia. And these were technologies that were pioneered and in many cases just run as infrastructure 
uh, by public institutions, uh, whether they were uh, military institutions or academic institutions or a combination of both. Um, and, you know, this is sort of a, a little bit lost to history, and I'll be mindful of time, but I love this tangent. When you type in facebook.com, the dot com is dot company. This is a reminder this is a corporation. And the reason that was there was a distinction because that wasn't the default, right? You were actually indicating that this was a space that was for uh, corporate use. And think about how dot com became synonymous with the internet itself, you know, by the turn of the century. Um, and that's a really, really interesting phenomenon to have happened. It needed to be signified initially and became the default by the time everybody showed up. So that context, I think, is just a really, really powerful thing to understand because what it prompts us for, and what I would also sort of ask all of you to do, is just observe. Look at your phone, look at the tabs you got open in your web browser, and think about them as having been made by people. Ask yourself who the people are. What are the values of the people that made it? What are the values of the people that own it? Think about why the things that move you, the art that moves you, you know the author of, you know the director of that film, you know the painter of that portrait, you know everything about the things that move you and resonate with you. And you might even be able to find the architect of that public space that's there. And then why we don't have a list of credits on the apps that we use. We don't have any way to see it. They're in fact masked. And what does it mean that workers are not empowered, recognized, credited for their work? Um, why is there no way to be able to see, like we do on IMDb, like I like I love cinematography in this film. I can see who it is in two clicks. That's pretty amazing, right? I'm going to nerd out about that. Uh, if an app or a website moves me, can I see who made it? And if it contradicts my desires and my values, if it quashes the party, you know, what can I do about it? Because the thing I would close on with this story about Ducati Park and organizing was um, eventually uh, those who were protesting in the Occupy movement were dispersed from Ducati Park. And the reason they could be is because it wasn't a public space. It was, a privately, uh, it was a privately owned public space. And so the corporation that owned that space could set the rules of engagement. Now, when I used to tell this story 10 years ago, people thought that was theoretical. I actually think amongst the many harms that have been caused, it's been very educational for people to see Twitter in these last three to six months, uh, because that is exactly what we're seeing. An owned space being used to do exactly what its owner wants it to do. And... What I want to prompt everybody for, and I know we're almost ready to sort of jump into the next phase of our conversation here, is to interrogate those apps we use every day. I'm not one of those people that's going to guilt anybody for like the tools you use to do your job or to connect with your friends. I mean, we all do what we got to do. But think more about what people were designing for. Contrast to when we know in the real world, it's very obvious what people are designing for us to do. If you've ever been trapped in like the back half of an Ikea where they don't let you get out without shopping for all the little goods that they want you to pick up, like, you know, exit through the gift shop is what's going on there. It's obvious in the physical world. It is less obvious how coercive these things are in the digital world, even though they are far more so. So just prompting everybody to think about that intention, what's there, the vestigial cultural memory you have of being in digital places that were made by people you know and love and had community with, and what we can do to just slightly increase the proportion of our time we spent in places that are made by people who care about us and people that we might even want to party with. That's what I got. I think we should start breaking down into all the ways that we can figure out how to solve these problems.